the next uh, topic will be uh, on the clock corrections, clock modeling interpolation. And Mike starts and will directly hand over to us. Thank you, Rolf. Um, so Urs and I will talk about clock, clock models and clocks in general and their use in um, PPP. Um, so I'm going to begin by talking about um, sort of clocks in general, a little bit about their models, different types of, of clocks that we have in the GNSS system and some of the products we have available to utilize. And then Urs is going to look at some particular solutions that he has worked on and some um, some data he's been looking at too. So this is just a brief overview. And I think I just described all of this. Um, so I will go on. So this ties nicely back into what uh, Rolf was describing at the beginning of the tour this morning, is that there's this geometry equation that effectively allows us to use the clock delays between a receiver and a satellite to figure out what the pseudo range and the clock offset is um, of your particular receiver. So a large solution can be done by an analysis center by basically taking a global network of these and all the satellites to do a solution for both orbits or positions in terms of in, when it comes to stations and the clock offsets between um, each of the um, subject clocks and some reference. There are other terms involved here, of course, we've heard about a number of them today. I just have troposphere and relativistic delays written here, but this, this list gets, gets kind of long after that. It's important that they be handled because inside of this, um, this error and this measurement in the clock offset um, are included all of these other things that the signal actually encounters. And things that aren't modeled can end up either as errors here in your position or errors there in your time. So the more that gets done, the better in terms of getting a nice clock solution. Each of the analysis centers has their own way to do this. They have their own software, they have their own approaches. And then after they determine their solutions for orbits and clocks that gets combined as Tom had discussed, um, the clock solutions then um, become available and the uh, variances on this deviations, the RMSs on that tend to be lower because we're taking um, independent solutions and putting them together in order to determine the values of, of ultimately the same thing, clock offsets on the satellites and at the stations. And some of the core products that we put out are for the clocks are final satellite and stations as well as rapids. Uh, we get those at five minutes, um, except final satellites are available at 30 seconds. And there's also some other products available. Um, the MGEX creates a, has a product for multi-GNSS at present, which we're moving towards in the core, but um, as was mentioned earlier, we're still moving towards it. MGEX has some availability now, and I'll be showing a little bit of that later. So we have solutions available at these different intervals, different times. So you've got a five minute or a 30 second, Okay, so for example, if you're looking at a 30 second timeline, then you have a clock solution in each of these points. But what if you need the value of the clock somewhere else? So if you want to do PPP or use clocks for some other reason, you need to know a value of the clock, for example, at 517, how would you get that? Okay, well, there's a couple of different ways you can imagine immediately. You can do interpolation. Um, if you need it in the future and you only have time up to 570, you may have to do a prediction. Um, but what is the effect of that going to be? Um, if we want to understand that, then we're going to have to understand a little bit more about what actually goes on with the clock in between these points where we're solving for them. The clocks themselves um, actually are running processes and, and noise processes running all the time. And when you're solving for them at a particular point, you're just looking for the offset at that time based on your measurement of the clocks and other geometric components going into that picture, as we saw in that equation. But you're not necessarily seeing the arcs of of, of what's going on with the clock's performance around that time. But you need to understand that if you wanna to start to venture out and make predictions about what the clock may have been at different times. So we need to understand clocks a little bit more. This is um, a general typical uh, three state model. Uh, in this case, actually I have a fourth state here, I have this total phase up in the top. But the clock consists of a number of different deterministic states, a drift, a frequency, and a phase. The phase is the thing that we often are typically are, are, are always measuring in GNSS. 
because it's telling us what the offset of the clock is. The total phase is probably more accurately what we see because there's this extra noise that we may have, but white noise is sometimes the observ can sometimes thought of observation noise indistinguishable from any other process we put in there. So these two are largely the same up to a difference of noise. If we want to model it well, sometimes we look at other environmental effects that are had on the clock and that can be input at this location so that we can also have that effect seen in theta rather than just P. But the clock itself puts out some kind of a phase. The actual unit will have a phase, and then there's derivatives, so frequency and two derivatives of drift. Um, and ultimately, what you get is some kind of a parabolic arc that um, gives you a deterministic sense of what the clock does over some period of time. Now, there's, of course, other things happening. There's noise coming in, and noise is involved at all of the different levels here. So we don't just have white noise on top, there's also noise on top of the frequency. Well, if there's noise at the frequency of the clock, that'll integrate to phase to give a random walk. There's also noise below that, possibly on the drift, which can integrate up to a random run. And even sometimes in models, we add white noise below that and integrate it to drift so that there's a random walk there and even a random, um, a random run on the frequency. So this model gives us flexibility to understand the clock. And in the IGS, we run um, a reference time service behind the clock products to actually evaluate and understand these components for different member clocks, and then to form uh, an average time um, as, as the processing continues from one day to the next. Each of these things now can be separated into a couple different parts, right? We can make a vector here of the deterministic components. Okay, so the phase frequency and drift can all go here. These are things that we largely compute and and uh, generally can understand pretty well with, with some good confidence intervals. So for example, one of the things we heard about today um, is you know, possibly you could have some delays in the antenna. You could have delays through a cable, which we'll hear about in a little while. Um, those things might appear in the phase of the clock, okay, if the cable was changed or if you have a different num or wrong number or whatever have you, um, but, but they're deterministic and they're known. So it's easy to predict the clock with that knowledge. The other component of these, these white noises, go into another vector. And these are all of the unknowns. We may understand what the process is like by looking at the clock's history, and we can characterize it. But we won't know in the future what the values of those are going to be because they're, they're completely stochastic. The, um, the statistics that are valuable to understand the white noise parameter are known as the Allen and the Hadamard variants. So those are probably the best measures to really get a good handle on what these are. Um, but I'm not going to get into that too much today because I'm only doing half a presentation. So I don't want to open up uh, too many details there. But if you're ever looking at clocks, those are good statistics to learn about and, and understand. This is a sampling of clocks from the IGS's MJEX products. Uh, I took this from um, Code Solution. I just took one day here for us to just take a sample look at. And I picked a number of different vehicles out of um, the sky from various constellations, just so we have contributors from all the different groups. Um, so you can see that there's a number of different types of clocks here. There are uh, clocks from you know, some older groups as some GLONASS, as a GLONASS clock and a Block 2R clock. The 2R satellites tend to have a little bit more noise on them than some of the newer satellites. So you can see that the noise processes that, that are here um, would make it a little bit more difficult to predict the clock or to interpolate the clock over any interval than some of the clocks we have on newer vehicles. So these bold lines in here are coming from, in the dark blue, you've got GPS 2F. I think that is a GPS 3 clock, this is Geo 4. Um, we have a Beidou 3 clock, we have a QZSS clock, and in the green we have one of the um, Galileo clocks. And you can see that from, from the more recent groups of satellites that are going up, a lot of these clocks have very similar types of performance. Over a day, we're looking at everything you know, well, well within almost a quarter nanosecond. Um, and again, a deterministic component was taken out of this. So this is just the unpredictable white noise component that's left over, which is the part that would give us errors um, uh, when we're trying to do positioning. So a couple of different approaches I mentioned earlier for um, filling in values of a clock. We don't actually have a solution at that particular time, our prediction and interpolation. Now for prediction, um, here's an example of how this sort of thing works. Okay, if you have a clock solution, 
let's say you take a section of that solution in red here, you can fit a polynomial to it. Okay, so that's this deterministic term here. And you've got the deterministic part updated by um, some kind of an operator that would usually be some kind of a parabolic matrix that gives you a parabolic update, phase frequency and drift. Um, predict it to a new value. Now, this is the best you would know. Assuming at the red boundary that you the clock solution ends there and you don't actually know what the rest of this is, the best you could do is get this prediction. But the clock is actually continuing with that plus the integrated white noise terms. And that's what ends up giving after some realization is had for the Ws, um, some process like this. So the actual error, the prediction error, uh, as you can see, can end up being quite sizable. Compared to an interpolation where now, I don't have this drawn out here, but if you imagine on the blue, if you're fitting a piecewise linear function at different intervals and then using the evaluation of that to get an estimate on the clock, you're going to have much smaller errors simply because you know both what you've got at the beginning and at the end of your intervals, as opposed to predictions where you're going forward without having that information. I have a number of different histograms that can show the effect of this based on the types of clocks I was showing um, back in the, the um, from, from code's MJEX solution. So the, um, this is just a histogram of the errors that you get if you were to fit an interpolation um, with sampling points nailed down uh, once per five minutes. So you can see that if you have five minutes, and then in between, we're using the actual 30 second solution to do uh, a comparison as truth. Um, the errors are going to be relatively small. Everything is underneath one centimeter here for the most part. You can see that after that, the distribution of errors is getting close in, in share down to about 0%. The only ones that continue to have errors for much longer time are the block to ours and, and the GLONASS satellites. But as you could see by the, the kinds of residuals they had, there was a lot more noise. So predictability, even over a short interval. Um, is going to be a little bit more challenging there. And there's a little bit about the um, uh, about the errors up to the 95 and 99%. You can see 99% are under 1.3 uh, centimeters. Others is is the, the main group here of, of the other clocks that are mostly uh, mostly have similar performance, Galileo, uh, GPS3, um, the 2Fs, 803, and QZSS. Uh, a lot of these are rubidiums, or in the case of Galileo, it's rubidium coupled with a passive hydrogen maser. Um, so again, um, you get very good performance from these, and you, you scarcely need to worry about, about that over a five-minute interval. In fact, most of what we're looking at here is just observation noise. Okay, that starts to spread out a bit if we look at longer intervals now. If we spread out over an hour, we have a histogram now that starts to expand up into the one centimeter range, gets up probably up towards two centimeters before these, these upper bands really start to, to come down closer to zero. Again, we still see that, that other core group of clocks um, with, with errors below a centimeter for a lot of the time. And the two Rs still have a wider distribution going a little bit further out up to maybe about the 10 centimeter range. Okay, if we're doing a six hour interpolation, um, then things start to, to scatter a bit more, but you know, this is understandable. The further apart you, you make those interpolation points, okay, the more that can go on with the white noise in between them. So um, in this case now, we've, we've got errors are gonna be going well out past the two centimeter level. Um, the point of this plot is just to show that things start to get a little bit unpredictable as to how, um, what kind of uh, level of error you can anticipate. Uh, when you're starting to extend the range of your interpolation. Now, even more so, this is an issue for predictions. Uh, I'm gonna go back a few. Remember for predictions, we can't nail down the other end of the interval. So this term matters a lot more okay, in terms of how much noise we're going to be um, having to deal with. Okay, so this, Histogram shows what we get when we're looking at predictions. So I fit predictions to the uh, solution from the code clocks, uh, extending their, um, their range over a one hour interval forward after a two hour fit, and then compared back to the actual clock value. And you can see in this case, we've got um, tens of centimeters easily. Um, a lot of the errors are, are under five, but you can easily get up to 10 or even up to 20 centimeters. Um, 
so the the amount of error in the prediction is is quite a bit more um, when when you start to look at predictions. And not surprisingly, this starts to grow when you when this window gets larger. Um, when you go up to the two hour predictions, now you're looking at getting up towards about a meter. And when you get up to one day predictions even, um, which is not infeasible, by the way, if you were using rapid products, for example, and you only had yesterday's uh, solution, you didn't have access to anything else at, at the time, you might have to predict up to that amount. Um, you know, the, a, a good amount of the errors, if you look at the distribution, are still under a half meter, but there are some that can creep up to higher values. So um, uh, using, using uh, clocks or trying to fill in clock values by using the model um, is, is a, you know, can be done, but, but um, they're, they're going to be building errors the further away you get from the solution point. Um, I'm going to stop and allow Urs to start now. He's going to talk about some particulars that um, he's done with some data and solutions. Okay, <clears throat> many thanks, Mike. So I take over. It's nice to be here and to see you all, at least your names. And it's clear that I'm, of course, still engaged in the IGS. So I try to share my screen. I hope it works. I hope you can see it. OK, so we'll talk a little bit now about using clocks, namely for PPP. Um, so I start with some uh, important remarks, of course, that Rolf already did, namely that if you do PPP, consistency is everything. So you are, for instance, not allowed to take the orbits from one provider and the clocks from another. Anyhow, you should take it from IGS, but you should also not mix final and rapid and so on. That's, of course, very important. And of course, you should also use consistent models uh, because you basically can still do some kind of differential positioning assessment to the IGS network. OK, that's, this is one very important remark. Um, then uh, let's look at these different clocks. So Mike already told we have this nice situation that we get better and better clocks while time is going on. Um, the question is, how does it uh, affect a PPP solution? So now, of course, again, we have to note that if we have the same data sampling as the sampling in the clock product, for instance, 30 second sampling with 30 second clock product sampling, then the clock does not matter. So it's, it's not the clock quality which matters, but it's the quality of the measurement of the clock which matters. So it's not the question what, what clocks are in the satellites, but it's a question how good IGS does its job to measure these clocks. But this is actually no longer valid as soon as you interpolate the clocks. So let's assume you are doing, you want to use one hertz tracking data um, because you, you want to do um, earthquake monitoring on remote island, um, but IGS provides you only 30 second clocks. So what, there's no, no, no other way to then to interpolate the clocks. And then the question is, how does it affect your solution? And that's the topic of what I want to present. And I did some experiments. I took one station uh, from our observatory in, in, at, in, at the Geodetic Observatory in Wetzel, um, and it took, which, which provides one hertz Renix files. And I, I did kinematic uh, PPP actually using least squares. So no, no issue with convergence uh, using code and phase. And, and you can see it's an ambiguity flowed solution because anyhow, we will have the, this topic in a follow-up talk. Um, and then simply doing for each measurement um, a position, getting these dots, a scatter plot in the NOS. Uh, east plane. Um, now, uh, I was actually using the code products, I admit, because there uh, the five second clocks are provided for GPS. So it's a GPS only solution. Um, and I can then use the five second as a truth and to, to interpolate from five seconds to one second. That's, that's valid because the interpolation error is below the phase noise, which was already shown. Okay, but now, so we can quantify this, these results here by uh, taking, for instance, the 95% percentile. So this, this circle uh, here that you see um, contains 95% of all the solutions of this outside here, only 5%. And you get here this value, which is something like a, a two sigma value. So the one sigma is then below one centimeter, which is 
pretty good for ambiguity float solution. Okay, now we can start to interpolate. Let's take um, 10 seconds. It looks like that. So you see, it's, it didn't change so much. So obviously that's valid. Let's go to 30 seconds. Yes, it's a little bit, little bit larger, uh, but still not, not dramatic. So maybe depending on the application, you can still interpolate. Let's zoom out because I want to drive it to the, to the limit. Um, so here, um, five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, nothing happens, uh, 30 seconds and so on, then we have one minute. So we already see that the solution gets a little bit worse. Two minutes, three, four, five minutes. So that's uh, one of the products that you get at five minute interval. We can already see some strange features here. Yes, we, we have to uh, to realize that, of course, we, we in linearly interpolate um, a random walk process and we get then some, some funny results, of course. Um, 10 minutes uh, and so on, 15 minutes, that's what, that's what you get from the SP3 file. So maybe you should not take these products to interpolate, at least with, with the current gun status and so on. So let's go further, half an hour uh, up to one hour. Okay, so that's the, uh, the limit that I wanted. We are, we are the 10 centimeters, so it's not so bad, but you can see it's maybe not what we should do. Okay, now what I want to represent it a little bit differently. So take these values here, so the horizontal and the vertical 95 percentile. We see clearly that the vertical is worse. That's also uh, obvious. It, it, it's more strongly affected by the clocks. So I take these values and represent it as a function of the interpolation interval. Then I can display it like that. So with that, we can see that movie at, at one glance. Okay, we can see that we get worse um, results, PPP results, if we do interpolation over longer intervals. But maybe relevant is this part. We have here now that the 15 minutes here, or maybe even, even this one, we have the five minutes here. We see we have maybe about a factor of five worse than if we do no interpolation. But that's still not so bad. Now, having these results, maybe we, we, we can have some, some other questions. So let's go back to the only the horizontal one to, to 15 minutes here. The question is maybe how did the situation look like 15 years ago? Uh, we still had had plenty of block 2A satellites at that time, which have less stable clocks. Um, now what I did, I, I tried to see what happened, but I wanted to use the same data to stay comparable. So I simply replaced the clocks um, in the satellites. Mm. Okay, that's maybe not technically not so not so not 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 so trivial, but actually I simply modified the input clock file accordingly. And then we get this result. Yes, we can see about factor of two worse because we have these uh, less stable clocks. If we replace all the satellites with block two A CCM clocks, then it would look like that. So um, yes, this was old days. These clocks were simply not so stable. But look, look at this here. These are the block two A rubidium clocks. Mm that's even better than today. So if all satellites would be equipped with these clocks would be even better than we have the situation today with GPS. The reason is that also Mike told that, that the, the block 2R have a relatively large short time uh, term noise that's introduced by the, not by the clock, but the, but the time keeping system on board of the satellite, while the clock actually would be more stable and one can see that on the, on the long term. Okay, now maybe come back to present time. Um, how would now the, the situation look like if we would have only these new, new nice clocks of uh, block 2F and, um, and block 3? Well, we can change all the clocks in the satellites and see what happens. And it looks like this. It's flat. Okay, you can interpolate. This is a little bit worse here, but not, not much. So that's new world. So that, that's the future. We will have a constellation with only good clocks. So, but now um, let's think about the following. We have already half of the constellation with these good clocks and we have other constellations, for instance, GPS with hydrogen masers. So let's combine them and we can do it now. We have the data. So how does it look like? It looks like this. Look at the red curve. The red curve is the interpolation errors in the PPP results that we get if we combine the good GPS clocks with the Galileo clocks. So that's definitely what we should do. And that's what we can do now. So the future is today. So, so we can do that. 
okay, that's what I wanted to show. Maybe a last thing, because we have Mike here. Um, I wanted also to see how would be the situation if we would put, um, um, uh, equip the satellites with this uh, very highly stable clocks that he runs in his lab. Um, so I replaced the, the, all, the, all, the, all the GPS satellites with these uh, active hydrogen measles. Um, well, they're a little bit heavy, but I managed to do that. And then the situation looks like that, completely flat. Okay, I extend it to one hour, you see still flat. And of course, these clocks are so stable that with one hour interpolation, you get an interpolation error, which is of the order of one picosecond. Okay, that's what I wanted to show you. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mike and Urs. It's impressive how you manage to exchange the clocks on flying satellites. Um, there is a question to Michael, I think for sake of time, Sebastiano, I just read it from the chat. What is the degree of the polynomial fit used to predict the clocks, Michael? Second order, uh, use a, a parabolic fit um, to fit. Well, I, I, let me correct that. I used a parabolic to predict, to do the predictions. So you fit a parabolic and then you predict for it because you really want to know what that drift term is. Okay. For the interpolation, I just did a linear fit because just two points in a line was, was good enough for the, the intervals we were looking at. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see other questions. So we are back to the schedule nearly. And then I can on over to Stefan, who will introduce biases and ambiguity resolutions. Thank you, Mike and Russ.